Today, we're talking about how we finally have answers to the 20-year-old cold case murder of Natalie Holloway, YouTube's fighting viewers who have ad blockers, the messy and heartbreaking situation and back and forth over that hospital that was bombed in Gaza, a new report has linked Andrew Tate to inspiring teens to be physically abusive in relationships, Alec Baldwin's gonna be recharged with manslaughter. We're talking about all that and so much more on today's extra-large Philip DeFranco show. You daily dive into the news, all made possible by beautiful bastards like you who take part in things like our October drop that we just dropped over at beautifulbastard.com. This is our most size-inclusive, comfiest drop to date. Our shirts, hoodies, and crews have our new custom blend. It's got that nice stretch fit. It fits perfect. Those hoodies, hoodie, if you know what that means. We've had more and more sizes selling out throughout the week, so grab what you want while you can. But with that said, we got a lot of news to talk about today, so hit that like button, let me know you like these big shows, and let's just jump into it. Starting with, well, today we finally have closure on a case of a missing girl that gripped the nation all the way back in 2005. Right, Natalie Holloway was an 18-year-old girl from Alabama who had just graduated from high school and went on a trip to Aruba to celebrate. But when she never showed up for her flight home, a chaperone called her mother and the search for this missing girl began. With Natalie having last been seen leaving a nightclub with three men, including a Dutch citizen named Joran van der Sloot. And notably, when he was interrogated, he changed his story several times, first saying they dropped her off at a hotel, then claiming one of them raped her at a beach. And he was arrested multiple times over the coming years, but ultimately he was let go by Aruban authorities due to a lack of direct evidence. Though he was later given a 28-year prison sentence in Peru for the murder of another woman there in 2010, where he remained until this last June because Peruvian authorities allowed his temporary release to the U.S. to face charges for extortion and wire fraud. Right, and those charges relating to an offer he made in 2010 to sell information on the location of Natalie's remains for $250,000. Right, and so he ended up pleading guilty to that, but as part of the plea deal, he agreed to finally disclose where and how Natalie died. With him finally giving his confession to her murder today, bringing this nearly two-decade-long tragedy to a close. And while obviously there is something to finally have closure, I mean, for Natalie's mother, it's hard to imagine how this didn't reopen old wounds. Because you had this just disgusting, deranged man telling them how he beat her daughter to death and then went home and watched porn. With him repeatedly saying he did it because she refused his sexual advances. So with all of that, Natalie's mother, Beth Holloway, reportedly said in the courtroom, for 19 years, you denied killing Natalie Holloway. Your lies have caused indiscernible pain. You were a killer and I want you to remember that. With her then, afterwards, speaking to reporters outside. He described when and how he killed her. He said that after killing her on the beach in Aruba, he put her into the water. And that was the last that he ever saw her. Now, as for Vandersloot, uh, he claims that he has been born again, and for the first time, he's expressing some remorse, saying, I would like to take this chance to apologize to the Holloway family, to apologize to my own family, to say I hope the statement I provided brings some kind of closure to everyone involved. And you, of course, can uh, judge how sincere that actually is and your feelings on that. Personally, I think this man should be burned to death. I mean, that kind of slipped out, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, my proposed punishment, uh, not something you can legally do. So he is getting another 20 years on top of the 28 years he's already been serving in Peru. And personally, I hope he never steps foot outside of prison walls ever again. And then, Andrew Tate is warping young people's perceptions of what is and is not okay in relationships. That is what the new Influencers and Attitudes report from Women's Aid, a domestic abuse charity based in the UK, found. Where the report was reportedly done to get an understanding of young people's perspectives so that it can inform the curriculum on relationships, sex, and health in schools. And with that, it asked about a number of things, including questions about Andrew Tate. And the report said, being exposed to misogynistic views on social media, specifically Andrew Tate content, was found to be clearly linked in children and young people with having significantly more harmful perceptions of relationships and greater tolerance of doing harm. For example, it was reported that children and young people exposed to misogynistic online content were nearly five times more likely to view hurting someone as acceptable. And specifically, they found 19% of children and young people who had seen Tate's content thought that hurting someone physically is okay if you say sorry after hurting them, which was a noticeable bump compared to only 4% of those not exposed to that same content thinking the same thing. On top of that, nearly one third of children exposed to content like Tate's believe, quote, there should always be one more dominant person in a relationship, whereas only 14% of children not exposed to that kind of content thought that. They were also reportedly more likely to view things like love bombing is acceptable, which if you're unfamiliar, the outlet described that as a harmful and potentially abusive behavior, including things like overwhelming someone with gifts and randomly showing up everywhere they go, with 35% of those exposed to Andrew Tate's content viewing that as romantic compared to just 13% who weren't exposed. Though the report also saying it's not like this is just an Andrew Tate thing, saying, quote, it is important to note that the popularity of Tate is not a phenomenon in and of itself. Instead, it's a current representation of existing misogyny. The content also correlates with a wider increase in the prevalence of so-called incel ideology, hatred against women and girls and back clash against the feminist movement alongside other media influencers that assert these viewpoints. And then, now have you ever had a day or a period of your life where you're like, I'm just, I'm not good at this job. And well, I'm here to tell you some good news and bad news. The good news is you are better at your job than the person I'm about to talk about. The bad news is I now have to explain why. Starting with Exhibit A, the Return to Nature Funeral Home in Penrose, Colorado, where they perform so-called green burials with biodegradable caskets and no embalming chemicals. Recently, police got a report of an abhorrent, absolutely putrid, just fucking rancid, foul, pungent smell 
coming from the building. So investigators went there, they went inside, and when you enter a funeral home, you know, you know, it smells awful. You know, you're gonna find dead bodies. That's not the surprise. But what really took them aback was the sheer number of rotting, decomposed corpses in this place. So far, they have found 189, with the sheriff saying the scene was so bad, a paramedic even developed a rash and had to be medically evaluated. And then over the next two weeks, workers undertook the grueling task of removing each and every mess of a body, loading them into refrigerated trucks and hauling them off. And now all the remains are at the El Paso County Coroner's Office, and people there will begin the possibly months-long process of collecting DNA, identifying bodies, and notifying families. But the big thing I want to note is, like, this is not a situation where you should be like, oh, environmentalists. Green burials do work and are legal under state law so long as bodies not buried within 24 hours be properly refrigerated. The owner of this place, on the other hand, apparently didn't do that, and he himself had been buried under legal troubles. Those including missing tax payments and eviction from one of his properties, and a lawsuit against his funeral home from a local crematory that halted business with him due to unpaid bills. And so now the owner has been accused of concealing the improper storage of bodies at his business, but so far, no charges have actually been filed against him. And notably, however guilty he is for this, you also have some people blaming Colorado for having some of the weakest funeral home oversight laws in the country, with the National Funeral Directors Association saying that it is the only state that doesn't require some minimal level of education and training in order to be licensed. Moreover, there is also no indication state regulators visited this home or contacted its owner until more than 10 months after its registration expired last November. And then, YouTube is cracking down on ad blockers, with a lot of people online sharing this new pop-up they received from YouTube while trying to watch a video with an ad blocker on, saying that ad blockers are not allowed and that you can't watch the video until you allow ads or subscribe to YouTube Premium. Now currently, you have Forbes reporting that just closing the pop-up allows the video to continue playing, but according to a Google spokesperson, users who repeatedly refuse to allow ads will have their playback disabled. And notably, th this isn't coming out of nowhere from YouTube. Where YouTube's actually been battling ad blockers for a while with testing of this system beginning back in June. And according to a YouTube spokesperson, ad blockers are against the platform's terms of service. And she went on to say ads, quote, support a diverse ecosystem of creators globally and allow billions to access their favorite content on YouTube. But what we've seen with this are many users furious with this change. And they've already begun searching for a way around it. Are people on Twitter saying things like, who's going to create the YouTube ad blocker that can unblock the YouTube blocker that blocks the unblocker? People also blaming YouTube for them even needing an ad blocker in the first place. Saying things like, if YouTube thinks that this is going to make people pay for premium or put up with their garbage ads and ad policies, they're wrong. This will only serve to push people and creators to alternate platforms even more. But then, on the other side of this, you have people saying, yeah, you shouldn't have ad blockers because if you're consuming content, you're supporting these creators, you're actually hurting them by having an ad blocker. One of the big arguments there is that is especially true for smaller creators. Because people that are fortunate like myself to have a pretty decent sized audience. AdSense, you know, how we get paid from YouTube ads, it's kind of the, the smallest way that we get paid. But they're largely being supported by like brand deals, clothing, stuff like that. Whereas smaller creators, you know, they rely on the ads way more. But with all that said, I got to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here, especially as you are currently consuming this content here? And then Alec Baldwin could be recharged over that tragic 2021 Rust shooting. With sources telling multiple outlets that special prosecutors will ask a grand jury to consider charges against him again, and specifically arguing that he should be indicted for involvement voluntary manslaughter, with special prosecutors Carrie T. Morrissey and Jason J. Lewis releasing a statement saying, after extensive investigation over the past several months, additional facts have come to light that we believe show Mr. Baldwin has criminal culpability. We believe the appropriate course of action is to permit a panel of New Mexico citizens to determine from here whether Mr. Baldwin should be held over for criminal trial. And if here you're wondering, like, didn't this already happen? Wasn't this, wasn't this solved? Well, kind of. Earlier this year, involuntary manslaughter charges were dropped against him, but there has always been a possibility that they could be refiled. Which if you need a quick refresher on the case, it all has to do with the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchinson. Baldwin was a producer and actor in the Rust movie, and they were rehearsing a scene that involved him pointing a gun at the camera. It fired, killing Hutchins and injuring the director. With Baldwin denying ever pulling the trigger, but that's been contested with analysis from a forensic expert finding that he must have pulled the trigger. Those lawyers have maintained that any charges against him are unwarranted, and saying in a statement, It is unfortunate that a terrible tragedy has been turned into this misguided prosecution. We will answer any charges in court. And according to NBC News, the case could go before a grand jury sometime in mid-November. And apparently there had been discussions of a plea deal to a petty misdemeanor, but it was all rescinded over the weekend. So for for now, we're gonna have to wait to see how all this plays out. And then, you know, one of my habits each morning is coming into my studio and taking my trusted DSO-1 daily symbiotic from today's sponsor, Seed. You know, I found Seed's DSO-1 over a year ago, which, by the way, has been the easiest habit, made the biggest impact on my gut health this year. And after a year taking Seed's DSO-1 daily symbiotic, I can say it's the real deal. It's provided me with healthy regularity, helping support digestion and my gut health. And added bonus, Seed also promotes heart health, immune support, and more. Yo, probiotics and prebiotics are a science. It's important that they're developed, manufactured, and vetted with science scientific rigor and precision and seed 
they get my trust. And thanks to Seed's Viacap delivery technology, unique capsule and capsule design, the strains actually make it to your colon with an average of 100% survivability rate. And while any time would be a great time to start with the holidays upon us and all that yummy food that goes with it, it's a good time to start taking care of your gut microbiome. Especially as this month, Seed's offering you beautiful bastards 25% off your first month. You receive this 30-day supply, refillable glass jar, and travel vial. And after that, they send sustainably packaged refills. So y'all, just go to Seed.com slash DeFranco and use code DeFranco at checkout to get 25% off your first order of Seed's DSO one daily symbiotic plus free shipping. And then, y'all, we all know how criminally poor the conditions of many jails and prisons are, but in some cases like that of 45-year-old Maurice Monk, it's just horrendous. Right, so he was arrested after he missed a court appearance for a misdemeanor case back in late 2021, with him then being sent to Santa Rita Jail in Dublin, California. And since he couldn't afford to post his $2,500 bail, he languished there for a month, with his family then later getting the news that their father had actually died in jail, and so they were absolutely shocked. So they start seeking answers as to what happened, and ultimately they filed a wrongful death lawsuit last year, with it claiming the jail staff failed to properly administer Monk's prescription medications for diabetes, schizophrenia, and high blood pressure, leading to his slow, torturous death. And then this month, they actually amended their complaint after watching over 150 body cam videos from inside the jail, with them alleging that staff actually noticed his deteriorating health, but still did nothing to help him. And then, in the most explosive claim yet, they say their father was left face down in his cell's bed for three full days before he was pronounced dead. Right? According to them, he was like that for so long, the red dye from his t-shirt stained his mattress. And an autopsy even found bed sores that he got from not moving for so long. And his food trays and medication cups accumulated untouched on the floor of his cell where staff had left them, Monk supposedly didn't respond to deputies calling his name. But according to the suit, one deputy could be heard saying he wasn't worried because, quote, I see him breathing. So now his family is demanding reforms, and three months after Monk's death, a judge put the jail under federal supervision for at least six years. And this because not only is mental health care notoriously bad, but over 60 people have died at the facility since 2014, including at least five this year alone. And then, as we all expected, the situation in Israel remains tense, especially after German Chancellor Olaf Scholz was caught on an Israeli runway during a rocket attack, with Scholz being hastily evacuated to a shelter while journalists and aides had to get off the plane ASAP and take cover laying low. Though the entire ordeal ended up being a minor delay to their plans, as shortly afterwards, Schultz and everyone else were able to board the plane and get out. But also, like, could you imagine what would happen if he got hurt? I mean, any country would respond, and while Germany doesn't necessarily have the capabilities to just launch airstrikes at Hamas, it also has one of the largest military arms industries in the world. But of course, that's hardly the only thing to have happened. While visiting, the Biden administration announced new sanctions against Hamas, and in particular, it was against many of its leaders and those helping the group to get money. With Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen saying in a statement, The United States is taking swift and decisive action to target Hamas's financiers and facilitators following its brutal and unconscionable massacre of Israeli civilians, including children. And on top of that, Biden is looking to ask Congress to approve a $100 billion aid package for U.S. allies around the world. And there we saw Senator Chuck Schumer saying about the deal, We intend to get the package at the end of this week, and it will include the military help Israel needs, the diplomatic and intelligence help Israel needs, as well as humanitarian aid to minimize the loss of innocent human life of Palestinians and Israelis. And Senator Lindsey Graham saying it's going to make a strong statement to our enemies and to our friends. While that may make it seem like this money is for Israel and some for Palestine, that's also just kind of the tip of the iceberg, and it will also give substantial aid to Ukraine and possibly Taiwan as well. At the same time, it'll also have some additional funding set aside to heavily boost U.S. immigration enforcement on the Mexico border. And those offerings are probably important to get hardline Republicans on board, because I mean, you had Biden trying to get roughly $20 million for Ukraine not too long ago. But any additional foreign aid was blocked after Congress just barely managed to fund the government through November. But again, this plan is still in the early stages, so do not be surprised if all that changes. Which actually, on the note, of plans suddenly changing, President Biden's schedule in Israel and Jordan was thrown into disarray after the president of the West Bank and the king of Jordan bailed meeting with him and Egyptian leaders. Though technically, the entire thing's just postponed, with the White House saying, after consulting with King Abdullah II of Jordan, and in light of the days of mourning announced by President Mohammed Abbas of the Palestinian Authority, President Biden will postpone his travel to Jordan and the planned meeting with these two leaders and the president of Egypt. And it makes sense that things would get delayed, with the White House statement alluding to the reason. The explosion at the Gaza hospital that allegedly killed hundreds. Arab countries were quick to blame Israel while Israel Israel was blaming another terror group in Gaza. But either way, that meeting was unlikely to be productive with everyone angry and upset over the deaths. And that actually brings us to the next thing. This hospital bombing has become one of the single most polarizing things out there right now. You know, right after it happened, we saw not only Jordan and West Bank authorities pulling out of their meetings with President Biden, but also massive protests in front of Israeli embassies and consulates all over the world. Since the explosion, we've also had more evidence from the site come out with President Joe Biden and many experts saying they don't think that Israel did it. And this alongside Israel presenting what it claims is undeniable proof that the explosion that hit the hospital came from within Gaza and from the 
Islamic Jihad group, with that evidence reportedly including things like footage showing rocket barrages coming from Gaza, and then at the exact same time, the explosion happening. Before and after photos of the site, they show that a rocket hit the parking lot area of the hospital and set a large fire, damaging many vehicles and some buildings. And one of the alleged reasons that the fire was so big was because the rocket crashed with a large amount of its propellant still on board. Right under their scenario, the rocket had just been launched, so that would make sense. They also showed the difference between what an Israeli missile or bomb would leave behind compared to whatever hit the hospital. Right, notably, Israeli ordinances are much bigger and leave noticeable craters behind. Right, I mean, they've been known to level entire buildings pretty easily. And that also brings us to the next thing. Right, the hospital may not be nearly as damaged as initially claimed. Footage from the site shows that the parking lot and many cars were damaged alongside a couple buildings, but that's also hardly the whole hospital complex. And this footage is coming from agencies like TAS, which is Russia's state-backed news organization, or from Gazans on the ground. Right, so it's not like people are just relying solely on the word of the IDF here. Though also another big piece of evidence they brought forward is an alleged audio recording between two members of Hamas. And in it, they say things like, <laughs> And so because of all this, there's been substantial pushback against news outlets and their initial coverage of the incident. There's also even serious doubts about the amount of people who died. And many, such as the BBC, have come under fire from Israel itself for tweeting, hundreds of people have been killed in an Israeli strike on a hospital in Gaza, according to Palestinian officials. Only to then tweet, a spokesperson for the Israel Defense Forces says communication from Gaza discussed a misfired rocket. The BBC has not been able to verify his claims. Right, with one of the big criticisms being they put a big caveat on what the Israeli officials said while not doing the same for Hamas, which led to the Israeli Defense Force Twitter saying, the BBC claims to be impartial and independent, but we were unable to verify those close. Instead, they choose to believe a genocidal terrorist organization. They also took shots at Al Jazeera, which wrote, Israeli air attacks have killed hundreds of Palestinians in Al-Ali Arab Hospital in Gaza City, where thousands are seeking medical treatment and shelter from heavy bombardment. And with that, the IDF pointing at footage from Al Jazeera itself that showed at 6.59 p.m. a rocket was heading toward Israel, then failed and exploded. And at that exact same time, the Gazan hospital was hit, implying, of course, that the two events are clearly tied, or it's a gigantic coincidence they happened at the same time. Also, outside of the IDF, pundits like Ben Shapiro were also critical of the media jumping so quick on this this was an Israeli airstrike narrative, writing, media reported a Hamas lie. Mass protests slash riots erupted in multiple Muslim countries. Muslim governments bought the lie and parroted it and decided to cancel all negotiations surrounding an end to the conflict. Really well done, you truth-seeking peace lovers in the media. Although with all of this, there were many who doubted Israel's claims. Right, and that included a lot of people, including prominent personalities like Hassan Piker tweeting that they generally don't believe Israel, so why start now with comments like, IDF argument is also laughably insane. Hamas and PIJ are bad, which is true, and they misfired a rocket that killed many in a hospital that we have shelled, and the only way to stop them is by firing missiles on children that we're depriving of food, water, and power for the last 10 days. And saying, even though I think it's incredibly unlikely that the hospital was bombed by Hamas or Islamic Jihad accidentally, it is funny to me that the IDF is basically saying only Israel gets to kill Palestinians and it's fucked up when anyone else does it. And Hassan arguing that this is bigger than just one moment, saying, I'm losing my mind. Israel has been bombing Gaza and has shut off water, power, and food into Gaza for the past 10 days. They've killed 4,200 people, 1,000 plus are children. This last bombing is still not independently verified, but even if it is PIJ, it would make up a fraction of the toll. Meanwhile, you had others attacking the evidence itself and doubting that the recording from the alleged Hamas operatives was real with claims like, just so we're clear, this is not a Gaza accent and not an organic conversation like at all. As well as Israel literally had no information whatsoever about the initial Hamas attack, but somehow they got recording of secret conversations in Gaza confessing they bombed their own hospital. The way that sounds too scripted is hilarious. But then also in the midst of all this chaos and mess, you have people saying it feels like more and more people don't care about what the actual truth is. Or as one put it, well, this is, in absolutely professional terms, a clusterfuck. And saying at this point, no matter how much evidence comes out to back one side of the explanation or the other, no one cares. Just going to lead to escalation that many, especially on here, seek and cheer on. But with now all that said, really the only thing I can say definitively here is this, this whole situation is a nightmare in so many different ways. But in addition to the nightmare situation that is all the human suffering that we are witnessing, is we are seeing a war on information like we've not really seen before. Everyone's propaganda machines are running. There are claims and counterclaims. People are having to fucking issue retractions every 30 minutes because everyone's trying to be the first on something. If anything seems to remotely benefit one side, it's immediately grabbed onto and promoted by some. And all of it's made even worse by the fact that Twitter is a fucking nightmare now. We got people with $8 check marks, some followers and times on their hands just saying stuff. People are jumping onto it. It's like affecting international policy and reactions. And it's unfortunately in all that chaos and confusion that more more atrocities will happen. And so again, that's why every time we talk about this, I stress the fact that this is a developing situation where we're talking about like 
what happened, what people are claiming here and there, understand in the fog of war and all the chaos, it's hard to know exactly what happened on the ground, especially in the aftermath. But for now, that is where we are, and I'm sure there's gonna be a lot more to talk about tomorrow. And then, y'all, the Jim Jordan mess just got messier. Because not only did he lose another House Speaker vote, he literally lost more votes than he gained. Right, yesterday we talked about how Jordan had received 200 votes in the first round of voting, 17 short of what he needed after 20 members of his own party voted against him. With Jordan then, after that, going to work to try to get those 20 holdouts to back him, with him notably only able to flip two. And that also didn't matter because he ended up getting a net loss with four Republicans who voted for him the first time, defecting and voting against him in the second round. And to make matters even more embarrassing, you had the Washington Post reporting that this latest vote set a modern record, the lowest vote tally for majority's nominee to be speaker, and adding that no majority nominee has received less than 200 votes in a really long time. But despite all this, Jordan is not giving up. With a spokesperson for Jim, I didn't see nothing Jordan telling reporters we're going to keep going. And Jordan himself echoing that, saying, we picked up some today, a couple dropped off, but they voted for me before, I think they can come back again. And also telling reporters later that he expects the next vote to be held tomorrow. But right now, it's totally unclear if anything will change substantially in such a short time frame. And to that point, it's unclear to everyone what happens from here. Or we really don't know what Jordan will have to do to win over those opposing members of his party, or if he even can. And meanwhile, things are getting so dire that some Republicans are even calling for Congress to give more power to Speaker Pro Tempore Patrick McHenry, who stepped in when McCarthy was ousted. And that's because all of this is so unprecedented that it's entirely unclear how much power that position actually holds. So McHenry has played it safe, interpreting his authority as limited to just overseeing the election of a new Speaker, but not the passage of legislation, essentially bringing all business in the House to a total standstill. And it also seems like the idea of empowering McHenry has also divided the GOP, with some members opposing it. And even beyond all that, multiple Republicans who voted against Jordan have said they are literally facing threats and intimidation from the far-right congressman's allies. Some have provided specifics like being threatened with primary challengers, while others have just kept it vague. But I mean, the shit has gotten so out of pocket that we literally saw the wife of Representative Don Bacon, a Republican who voted against Jordan, receiving anonymous threatening text messages about her husband. With Bacon sharing those texts with a political reporter who posted them on X, and boy, are they fucking weird. Messages telling Bacon's wife to encourage her husband to vote for Jordan, accusing him of causing chaos, and at one point even saying, your husband will not hold any political office ever again. What a disappointment and failure he is. Meanwhile, you have Fox News just flaming the fire with Brian Kilmeade getting caught on a hot mic when Bacon cast his vote against Jordan yesterday. Bacon. McCarthy. McCarthy. Dumb and so with all this, you have a lot of Democrats saying this bullshit is just going to become the norm if Jordan ever wins this thing. With AOC retweeting a post about the messages sent to Bacon's wife receiving threats and writing, if House GOP want to stand for their families to receive anonymous political threats every time their leadership wants to push a tough vote, they can vote Jordan. But they'd be fools to think that this is the last time it happens. Members who vote for him affirm this kind of practice. And then, you know, I want to take a second to thank our partner Incogni, not only for sponsoring today's show, but also for offering a service to help us all who have been victims of data breaches. I mean, Las Vegas sound familiar? And it's not just the recent breach of top casinos, data brokers, marketing brokers, financial information brokers, all sell what they have on you to third parties. And Incogni is a service that finds and deletes this information for you. You know, when I signed up, I immediately saw how many data brokers had my information, which I mean, I was fucking appalled. I felt kind of violated, but then I also saw within a week, Incogni had already started their reach out and are having them scrubbed out as I speak to you. With as little as a phone number, old address, or a name to start them off, complete strangers can buy records containing an alarming amount of your sensitive information. But Incogni can automatically remove your personal data from these kinds of websites. And if you're privacy conscious or you just don't like the idea of randoms finding out where you live or you work, it just makes sense to take advantage of a service that keeps this information private. So just go to incogni.com slash DeFranco and don't forget to use code DeFranco to get 60% off. That's incogni.com slash DeFranco and use code DeFranco to take your personal data off the market. And then, y'all, I get eating MREs if you're a soldier fighting in Iraq or Afghanistan, but should we really be serving them to school children? That is the question being debated once again in the only country broken enough to ask it, the United States. And this because Kraft Heinz finally smuggled its ultra-processed, ready-to-eat Lunchables into K-12 schools across the country this fall. With a company saying that it spent nearly two years modifying the ingredients in its turkey and cheddar cracker stacker and its extra cheesy pizza to meet USDA food and nutrition service standards. Doing this by lowering the amount of saturated fat, increasing the protein, and adding whole grains to its crackers. But then, when some nutrition experts actually saw the new products, they were like, hey, this is this is almost identical to the junky store-bought version. And shocker, turns out they're still pretty junky. Like Kraft Heinz met protein requirements by increasing the amount of turkey and cheese in the cracker stackers, but that also raised the sodium content as well. So now the school version actually contains roughly 25% more sodium than the store version according to the company's own nutritional data. Moreover, the school version technically has one gram less saturated fat, but the percentage of overall calories made up by fat is nearly double the USDA daily limit for a school lunch. And so now, school districts serving the nearly 30 million kids funded by the National School Lunch Program have the option to dish out these meals packed with additives for flavor, texture, and shelf life. And understand, this is literally killing future generations. Studies have linked ultra-processed foods to chronic disease and obesity 
obesity. And already nearly 20% of American kids are obese, four times the rate than in the 1970s and much higher than most other countries. Meanwhile, the consumption of highly processed foods has risen steadily to more than half the calories Americans consume. And notably, money plays a huge factor with poor children consuming most of the federally subsidized school lunches while those at wealthy private schools get basically gourmet cuisine. And despite there being continued calls to tighten up nutrition standards, the last major overhaul of regulations was over a decade ago. While that effort, which was led by Michelle Obama, made lots of gains, it still fell far, far short of its goals. Right back then, the USDA was like, hey, we need to limit the amount of starchy vegetables and tomato sauce kids could eat. But then, notably, thanks to the intervention of key lawmakers, French fries and pizza sauce still count as vegetables by some fucking genius logic. Right, you had Republicans, Susan Collins and other lawmakers representing potato growing states defending the nutritious value of fries. And you also had Democrat Amy Klobuchar, whose state was home to food producer Schwann's defending tomato paste using language very notably identical to Senate testimony from a company executive. But also, notably, the alleged corruption reaches all the way into the school system itself, with a school nutrition association, which is supposed to represent 50,000 school lunch workers, actually getting about half of its revenue from the companies that provide the food, equipment, and services for school meal programs. So it held a conference in Denver back in July. It was pretty much a giant advertisement for Kraft Heinz and 300 other food companies, with them getting direct access to school nutrition directors and buyers who represent billions of dollars in purchasing power. But I also don't want to suggest that it is as simple as school officials getting manipulated by industry giants, though I would personally argue it is a very important factor to remember. But also, for schools dealing with a shortage of low-wage food prep workers and whose kitchens and ovens are dysfunctional, easy grab-and-go meals like Lunchables are an attractive option, which is probably part of the reason why so many officials actually welcome the new products into an already unhealthy menu for kids. Right? I mean, you can see things like one school the Washington Post visited providing whole grain Cheez-Its on top of the crackers served with Lunchables to meet weekly requirements. And then, if the kids don't want the Lunchables, they can choose walking tacos instead, which is a bag of Doritos enriched with whole grains that they can smother in taco meat, beans, salsa, cheese, and sour cream. And it's also said you have schools and federal regulators kind of aware that schools can't stray too far from what kids are eating at home. Right? So it's being said that even if they have the resources to provide healthier meals, it's hard to change the system as long as the food industry still has a grip on the appetites of households across the states. And actually with that, a post-analysis found that of the $18 billion spent on national and local television food advertising between 2017 and 2022, fast food ate up the largest share by far, taking up 38% of all food ads, candy coming in at second with 12%, leaving just 0.3% for fresh produce. However, we're also seeing the Agriculture Department proposing to further restrict sodium in school lunches and added sugar in cereals, flavored milks, desserts, and yogurts starting in fall of 2025. But there, Republicans are moving to stop the measures with Glenn Thompson, chairman of the House Agriculture Committee, stepping in, saying he opposes the effort to reduce the amount of added sugar in chocolate and strawberry-flavored milk and wants to revisit the 11-year-old ban on whole and 2% milk. And also, I'm sure it is just a coincidence that he took nearly a million dollars in donations from businesses including dairy farmers, meat producers, and food companies in the 2021-2022 election cycle. And you know, personally, when I look at stories like this, it's just, it, it is kind of amazing, at least from a business standpoint, right? Just like how generally cheap it is for these companies to throw money around and uh, for politicians to go, yeah, that's enough to poison our children, our land, our future. But yeah, with all that said, now you know uh, another fun way that American politicians are selling you out. Because why care about the future health of our children when we got to focus on the big things like getting reelected? Sure, I'm helping fuel the obesity epidemic in this country, and it's going to lead to people living harder lives and a bigger strain on the economy. But those campaign ads aren't going to pay for themselves. And then let's talk about Yesterday Today, where you take a look back at yesterday's show where we covered a lot of news and we dive into those comments and see what stories stood out to you. What were your thoughts, your opinions, your experiences? And yesterday, a lot of the conversation was centered around Gigi Hadid being targeted by Israel's official social media accounts. Y'all saying things like, man, I hate how tribalistic humans are. We've seen it in the past elections, but the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is just making it all the more clear how bad it is. Gigi saying that, quote, hey, how about we don't kill, torture, maim, or persecute people based on who they are and instead place blame on the organizations and people in those groups that are actually causing problems and ruining lives, getting death threats and shame from a government? That alone should tell you that the government that did is so corrupt and has no designs that include peace and understanding. People also saying the Israeli government responding to Gigi Hadid is so weird, like why is a country acting like a T account? Absolutely embarrassing. Some saying all they got from the situation is that Israel doesn't even consider that Palestinians and Hamas are two completely different groups, and saying that makes me scared to think about what the aftermath of this is going to look like. In addition to that, there are also a lot of comments and conversation around small homes, right? and that including all the problems with the housing market right now. People sharing things like we bought a very small house in 2019 for about $210,000 and saying it wasn't supposed to be our forever home, but for the reasons you mentioned, I think it might be. We don't plan on having kids, so it works for now, but rates are so high we could never afford anything bigger or newer. People also describing the situation as genuinely insane. Sharing after years of working contractor jobs, I got hired as an actual employee making $65,000. That's nearly twice the national median income of $35,000, and even if I save most of my money, I cannot outsave for a down payment on a house in this market. And saying interest rates aside, the median home price is $400,000. And saying for me, if I want to save up for 
for a 20% down payment for a $400,000 house is going to be 80K. And that makes the mortgage payments over half my monthly income. It'll take me three years to save that up, right? And regarding those monthly payments, I really think that highlights the difference between a 3% and an 8% interest rate like we talked about yesterday. It is such a drastic difference, even though it sounds like, oh, it's just 5%. But then finally, just so we can end the show on a not completely miserable note, a lot of y'all shared your experiences of going to the Taylor Swift concert movie. And in general, if I can sum up 98% of those comments, it was like totally so fun. We were dancing, we were singing, we were trading bracelets. We started prayer circles to keep Travis Kelsey's ankles healthy. But also, some surprise that this wasn't even a bigger thing before. So to be honest, I'm surprised this Taylor Swift audience participation thing hasn't caught on sooner. I mean, look at Rocky Horror Picture Show. That movie's been around since the 70s, and going to one of the shows is an audience participation event with people dressing up, saying things during the movie, dancing, and even throwing things around. And adding with this Taylor Swift movie, I see this as the next evolution in movie theaters, saying people really aren't going to the theater anymore and they can just wait and stream it from home. But if it's a massive event where you get to be part of the show, well, you get something special and people will flock to see you. that, I'll say, you know, time will tell. And that is where your daily dive into the news is going to end today. But of course, for more news you need to know, I got you covered right here. You can click or tap. I got links in the description down below. You can also treat yourself to some fantastic, beautiful bastard gear that we just dropped this week. But as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you right back here tomorrow for more news.